Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Wow, that exciting, huh? Uh, well, if we can't be informative, at least we'll try to be somewhat entertaining, keep you awake. Um, I'm Adam Young. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I think that's a very small fragment here. I see all my friends in the audience. Um, I am from Red Hat. And I'm Christy Nicola. I'm from the Massachusetts Open Cloud. And we're here to pump you up. No, we're here to talk about per API role-based access control, which I know is just the burning thing you all want to hear about. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how access is done in, um, or how people want to be able to do access control within OpenStack deployments. Um, the current implementation of how RBAC, role-based access control, shortened to RBAC, is done, and the things that we're proposing to make things better, or things that we're, we have in flight to make things better. Okay, so the, the analogy I often give um, when talking about access control is, um, this is, this is my car, and if I were to try to lend you my car, um, I'd have to give you the key to my car, which you can also see in the picture here, and this key is what's called a proximity key. I don't actually have to put it in the car um, in order to start it, or even to open the door, I can just touch it, and you can imagine that, you know, this, this is very convenient, but it also means that if I have two of these, I don't really know which one's running the car. I don't know which one's actually opening the door to the car, which is probably not a problem since I only have one car, but if I had more than one car, or if I were, say, a rental car company or something like that, then I would need some way of being able to figure out, um, you know, of these many keys that I have, which one do I use to get in the car? And imagine if you had to lend out your entire key ring to anybody who wanted to borrow any one of your cars and you were a rental car company, this would probably be a suboptimal solution. So that's kind of what we're at with Keystone nowadays. Right now, the key to the car is the role. You have a role on a project and you use that to get access to things in OpenStack and you don't really know which one of them you're using to do the actual operation, you just give them all, including if you're an admin and you're just trying to do a really small thing. Now, Another thing that's come up time and time again is that we have new types of resources, or even for the different types of resources, we need different roles. And I kind of liken this to the different permissions you have on your driver's license for being able to drive different types of vehicles. I actually was at one point qualified to drive a motorcycle, but that does not mean I should be driving either an 18-wheeler, uh, an aircraft, or strapping somebody to me and jumping out of said aircraft. Those are all things that require their own qualifications to get out. Those are comparable to separate roles for separate resource types. And then, sorry, I don't have a funky uh, metaphor for this here, but something, and the thing that kicked this all off was many, many years ago, I was asked by the Horizon team, how can we figure out, based on the roles that a user has, what to show them? And so I've, I've circled on the screen here the, um, the toolbar, which is just like the, the top level set of operations that somebody would do if they're going into Horizon and trying to manage their OpenStack cluster. And so the three use cases as we've deduced from this is first of all, on delegations. What role do I need to give out to somebody in order to perform this action? How do I add additional roles to restrict a user to only a subset of the overall actions, not everything? And how do I modify the user interface, not just for Horizon, mind you, but for all of the tools that are out there to show them only the ones that they can and, and give them directed use cases and d directed user experience on their interface. This is a simplified model of the access to resources um, type of objects that we have in Keystone that's used for the rest of OpenStack. Um, a user or a group is given an assignment on a project, and that assignment is tied to a role. So it's a, it's a, it's a tuple with three values in there user or group, project or domain, but we're not gonna talk about that, and the role object itself. And then when we get to the actual service, there's gonna be some policy rule that's tied to the API that they're trying to call that gives access to the resource, again, and tied to that project. And that's why you see here, let me see if I can do this without shutting down thing. That's why you can see here, there's two different things coming into project. There's the user side and there's the resource side, and that's what we're trying to figure out. That's that access control, who can, who can get in there? So user goes to Keystone, and they send um, some, I'm, I'm using a picture here, kind of like their picture ID, some credential, some way of identifying themselves remotely 
to the Keystone server and they get back a token. That token is then going to be used when they go to talk to Cinder, yes, that's a Cinder block, talking to Keystone, um, and they're gonna pass that, that token on to Keystone, as, or Cinder's gonna pass that token on to Keystone and request a validation, and assuming that it's okay, it's gonna come back, you see our, uh, our person has uh, a hat on, to imply they're wearing a different hat, that's their role, and Cinder says this is okay, does its work, and returns a success message to our end user. And what's in that validation response? Well, there's three basic things. Who is the user requesting this? What roles do they have? And on what project is, is it there? I'm trying to give you some visuals again to go along with that. Okay, once Cinder, or whatever the remote service is, gets the, uh, the request, and you can see that's gonna probably start off with something like HA proxy or something like that, it's gonna pass through a pipeline. Um, the first thing that happens is it hits the, Keystone managed code called auth token. Auth token is a middleware piece, and one of the biggest things it does is does this remote call to Keystone. And assuming the Keystone returns back a successful validation, including that data we saw on the earlier slides, it's gonna validate the parameters, it's going to read from the database, and then it's gonna enforce policy on that, and assuming that, again, the policy checks, it's gonna do a state change. And this is not, this is my view of trying to show what's happening logically within um, the, the, the scope of policy enforcement. Nobody else would present things this way. Most people are far more sane. Um, that policy check is implemented by a library called Oslo Policy, and which is a rules engine. And it answers a yes or no question, do you have access to what you're trying to do based on the token data and the resource data. And I use the term resource as a generic term to imply virtual machine, network if you're talking to Neutron, image if you're talking to Glance, and so forth. It's, Keystone doesn't know about the different resource types out there. Keystone middleware doesn't know about the resource types going out there, and keep that point in mind, because it's gonna come up later. It's just gonna say, based on this rule and the values you've given me, do you have access to it or not? It does a role check to see what are the set of roles on the token, and do those match the ones that I say are required to get access to this API? or this object, whatever it is, and it also does a scope check. Does the project on the token match? And while you might think of those all as one thing, they're really two distinct things. The scope check requires a resource from the database. You've got the token, and the token has associated with a project on it. In order to check that that matches on the resource locally, you have to fetch it from the database. The roles check doesn't have to. The role is just on the API that you're calling itself. So, this means that it has to be performed deep in the code, not in middleware. This is code the Nova team has to decide where to call from within the Nova API. The Cinder team has to decide where to call that from within their code, and thus it's very, very service specific. Some services have additional logic beyond these two checks, the role check and the scope check, um, but we're not gonna go too deeply into those. And in fact, I pulled out a couple rules from, I believe this from the Neutron, policy.json file to give you a sense of the kind of stuff that they're doing there. They have a, a top level rule, context is admin, and that just, just checks to see if the token has the admin role on it. Um, they also have a rule that they call owner, and that checks to see that the project ID matches, and then later on a rule that checks that these two things are together, or for um, this one other case, they have another role that they check in, role ADV SVC, which to be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea what it does. Okay, if there's no explicit scope check, every project has access to every project's resources. A user with a token on any project has access to any project. That's why this is a big stop sign, this is a big warning sign. There has to be an explicit scope check. If there isn't an explicit role check, then having a role, on any AP, a, a, a role on a project gives access to everything there. there. It doesn't matter the role you have. Once you have that role, you get access to all the APIs for that project. And here's some of the problems with it that the, the, the people have stumbled across and we're trying to move forward with. The scope check should not be edited. While you can crank it down, you can't change this. This is hard code. This is an engineering decision that should be made by people checking in Python code for the various remote services. Um, and yet we have it in the policy.json file and are telling people, go customize policy. Um, this is, again, suboptimal. 
And again, the scope check requires a resource from the database, which is deep within Python code, which means there's no way to map it back to the URL that you actually called all in there. Is it possible to write a tool to do that kind of stuff? Yeah, but then you have to enforce that everybody uses it and all that kind of stuff. Practically speaking, there is no way to map from the policy rule in effect to the URL that you're trying to do. And that, you know, we, we, I think you can, hopefully you can see how that connects to the use cases I talked about earlier. So once we dug through all this stuff, we tried to come up with, you know, what are, the, what are we trying to do to fix things? What are the inferred requirements um, that we can pull out of here? And these are the requirements we've inferred. How many people would be ready to string me up if I broke your deployment by changing policy? Okay. Um, thank those of you who didn't raise your hands. I appreciate your restraint. But I know that that um, didn't, that I know there's people who are very willing to tell me that they will string me up. Actually, they do it anyway. Um, we want a clear map from the API you're calling to the re role required to execute that API. We want to explicitly split the control into a role check stage and a scope check stage. We want to perform the role check in middleware, so it's code that can be applied to all services without them having to go and do additional engineering, but we want to enable it via configuration. Again, we don't want to force this on you up front because we don't want to break your existing stuff, but we want to make it available so that you can use it when it's ready for you. And finally, we want to enforce a default role to get around that whole, you know, any role is every role. We want to enforce a default role on the APIs until a more specific role is actually explicitly requested or an explicit rule is requested for a given API. And so that, that gets us down to the question I've been asked time and time again. Why can't we just do this with policy.json? We need an inventory of policy enforcement points, and we don't really have a way of um, mapping from the existing set that we have to the URLs. The policy cut points are deep in the code. We can't map there. The roles and the role assignment data are managed in Keystone, and yet policy.json is a config file. If we want to start making changes, we're going to tell you, go over to Keystone and make these API calls, and then deploy a new configuration file. And that's a really strange workflow. Um, and redeploying that may require restarting services, um, de um, deploying new files. Um, and again, it's, it's not the same. And when you start talking scalable multi-site deployments, it's, it's not a, a trivial thing to do. And dynamically updating the policy JSON file on the remote service side, if we were to tell Nova, here's how you update it, that's also really untenable, because then every service needs that API to update its own policy. Um, so once you start pulling all these things together, you realize that policy.json has some shortcomings, especially, and remember, I'm only trying to talk about the, the, the role-based access control side of this, making that more dynamic. So once you go through all these stages and you say, try this and try that, and believe me, I've been trying this for years. I've been battling dynamic policy for years. Some of you might have sat in my talks back in Vancouver and stuff like that and go, yeah, you were talking about it then? Yeah, I'm talking about it now. Whatever's left must be the truth. So I'm hoping that's what we've gotten to here. We've gone through a bunch of iterations, and what we have and we're about to present is, I believe, the right approach to go about doing it. And um, Christy is going to walk you through what we've got for an implementation uh, en route. So there you go. So uh, <clears throat> every operation in OpenStack is performed through API calls, through HTTP or HTTPS, as uh, Adam really strictly uh, argues for. <laughs> so each uh, HTTP request has headers, and in the headers, there is the token in the form of the X auth token header. This is the user's token. There's also accepts and content type, but I'm not going to talk about those here. There's also the verb of the operation, which can be get, put, post, delete, or patch, or whatever. There's the URL, uh, which uh, includes the endpoint ID and the path on the server. And uh, for some operation, there's also uh, a body uh, for post, put, patch, and JSON. And uh, Nova uh, relies heavily on uh, this body for, for performing actions, and Adam is going to talk about that after. So uh, as we said, we want to do a role check in the middleware such that an HTTP request is allowed in only if the user, and in this case the token that the user presents to the middleware, has that role. We also want to... Uh, have defaults such that if uh, 
there is no clear uh, rule for this API than to have a catch-all default for this uh, API call. Yeah. So as we said, this will be done in the auth token middleware. Right now, the auth token middleware just does the Keystone server token validation. And during this tokens, token validation, the uh, middleware gets back the list of roles that this token has on a project. So the middleware knows the roles that the user has. And it can therefore perform a role check for this HTTP request. But we need a way to define which API requires which roles. Uh, for that, we have defined an entity called a route. So a route is composed of a service, which is a string. It can be the endpoint type, like compute image, but it can also be any type of string. This allows for endpoint-specific uh, uh, values. Uh, a verb, which is the normal HTTP verb, get, post, put, but it also allows for a wildcard, so you can catch all the verbs. And a path, which is prior to the variable uh, substitution. Uh, this will include the version so that you can have uh, different role requirements for different versions of the API. And it will also include a wildcard default, so you can have a catch-all, or you can catch only some part of the, the API calls. And of course, the role requirement for this API, uh, one role. And, uh, why should we be restricted to one explicit role per mapping? This is because uh, you can build more sophisticated uh, structures with implied roles, and only really one role is required to, uh, to be defined. So for example, with implied roles, if, uh, so implied roles are a relationship between two roles, such that if you have the first role, then you also implicitly have the second role. So if a user has admin, then uh, they implicitly also have member, and they also implicitly have reader as defined in this uh, uh, diagram here. Uh, role hierarchies, implied role hierarchies should be uh, di directed icyclic graphs, of course. And uh, the effective uh, list of roles, including the implicit roles, is uh, gotten back to the middleware from the, from the token validation step from the server. So this is built in Keystone. Uh, this is uh, an entity, uh, a root definition. So uh, for getting information about the servers, uh, you would call the v3 servers uh, uh, API, uh, the v3 service path, uh, with the get, and uh, the service type the service type is compute here. The role required for this uh, is reader, but by doing the expansion of the implicit roles, uh, admin and member can also do this operation. Now, uh, how can you find which path and which verb you need? How, how do you construct your routes? And this is all well documented in the API references for all the projects. And you can even programmatically fetch it and uh, update your, your routes in bulk. And we have uh, created a, a bulk uh, upload interface for, for uh, up updating your routes. There is also a single uh, create, read, update, delete interface for single routes. So this is the example for a catch-all uh, for a catch-all route, which catches all the uh, API operations for Keystone and adds the member requirement to them. This is as close as you can get to the current uh, defaults. And uh, this is not enabled by default in the middleware. There are uh, configuration options for you to enable it. Uh, as you can see there, check role in middleware equals true. And you also define in the uh, nova.conf the service type, so it doesn't have to be uh, compute. It can be anything endpoint specific. But yeah, this isn't enabled by default. You have to explicitly enable it. And the spec status was uh, so the spec for this was approved, and it's currently in backlog. It's been reproposed for Pike. Uh, 
uh, and there's discussion going on in that. Uh, there's work in progress code, which is at a high level of completion for this, and it's uh, waiting mostly for reviews, and that's my part of the talk. Going back to Adam. Thank you, Christy. Okay, so, um, and I know there's gonna be a lot of questions about this kind of stuff later on, um, and we'll, that's hope, hopefully we're gonna have time for that here. One of the things I know that a lot of people are wondering is like, what is this gonna do to my workflow? How am I gonna be able to take advantage of this? How is this gonna solve those questions that you brought up in the use case up at the front? So one of the big ones I wanna walk through is what's gonna be like for creating a new role, that third use case. And so the first thing you're gonna do so let's say we, right now we just have admin and member, which is the, the standard for a, a uh, deployment. I want to add a reader role. Okay, this has been a request, probably the single largest request for new roles. First, I'm going to create that role. Yeah, I see, I see some, some thumbs up. Good. I'm getting some, some positive feedback. So I create the role. I create a role inference rule that says member implies reader. So now everybody that was a member is also a reader. And this means that I can now add a route. I can add a new API mapping to, say, some operation such as, you know, get information about a server that requires the reader role, and everybody that was able to do it before, because this was under the catch-all as member, um, they still have the, the member one explicitly assigned, they also have reader implicitly assigned, they can do it. But that means that we can assign this new reader role to a new user, and those users can now do just this one route. And then you can remove member from them if they were there before, or from other users that should only be readers. Um, and remember, if you remove rem member, but you don't assign them reader explicitly, you've just taken away everything from them. But that's a good thing, that's how we want it to work. So you remove member from the unprivileged users, and now you've just rolled a new, um, rolled a new role into your system. Um, so we have workflow in place, and this is, you know, this is before us coming up and saying, here's a, the, the set of roles that we're gonna provide for you. This is a way for us to be able to get a tool in place to move it forward without breaking anything. Remember that first requirement. Um, when we talk about roles, one way that I've often described uh, thinking about it and way that you could then use this is a three-tiered approach. And again, this is an atomism. This is the way that I talk about it. I think it's saying um, I've, I can't really claim that I came up with this. I stole it from what we're doing in free IPA, and so it does map to pre-existing art. But at the top level, you have your position in the, in the organization. You know, I'm, you know, to make the distinction between a program manager and a product manager and a uh, professional manager or whatever it is, um, I'm a database administrator, whatever it is. But just because I have the same role as somebody else doesn't mean I'm doing a, comp or I'm having, just because I have different roles from somebody else doesn't mean I'm not doing the same operations as they are. So I want to be able to share workflow across those users, and in fact, certain workflows share operations. So if we have a three-tiered level structure like this, we can build a structure that maps to how our organization wants to provide access control. So I'm going to keep that up there as a key and, and walk through an example where first I create an accounting role, and at the year end, they have to do a roll up, which let's we'll just say it's a Hadoop job, okay? So we grant them the, uh, an implied role between accountant and Hadoop job, and yeah, underscores and all that kind of stuff. Let's just, whatever. Um, and then, oh, there's their underscores. So we also have a, the create server role, which maps one-to-one -one with an operation to actually create a server. Well, in order to do that, we have to make sure the Hadoop job has the implied role, create server, and Anytime you create a server, you always need to connect it to a network. So we're going to make a role inference rule between that. So just by giving them the accountant organizational role, they're going to have three additional roles as well and can perform their job, the Hadoop job, to do their year-end roundup. Now, our database administrator has to do similar kind of stuff. They want to create a Galera cluster, so we give them the role that allows them to do that. And creating a Galera cluster, of course, has to create server. And look, by having that, they also have the role to be able to connect to the network. Now, QA engineer has to do the same kind of thing, because he has to test what the database administrator is doing. Um, but he also has the additional job, the additional workflow of being able to push to production, which also needs to be able to create a server. So we provide them with that role, and it turns out that they also need to be able to create an image. So we give them additional role off the push to production workflow role that gives them that. All this means that we can only specify one role, and yet 
have everything that they need to be able to do their job and delegate on down. And why delegation? Well, who does that DBA and who does that QA engineer get their power from? In theory, they get it from their manager. And their manager should also be able to perform these operations. So if we give the manager the DBA role or the manager the QA role, they can now perform all the operations of the people underneath them. So these are some of the workflow roles that we've, we've discussed. Again, the read-only, the auditor role. Um, perhaps you need a special role for high availability, which I believe um, Heat was the one who asked me for, and which is another thing that drove this stuff from many years ago. Um, perhaps I want to be able to separate the people who can create project networks from the people who can't. Most of my people should just be connecting to the networks because they're going to screw up Neutron. Neutron's the hardest thing to get right when you're doing a, a lab, as I found doing a lab here X number of years ago. Let's keep that for the people who are, are smart and then have a, a distinction between the members and the, uh, the people who are network admins and members for a given project. And um, that's kind of like how DreamHost actually does their stuff by default. Um, or perhaps I want to do the opposite side of that, which is a limited member who can only do some of the subset of stuff. And in the extreme, as you saw, we might want to be able to say one role per operation. So anything we want to be able to delegate sans any other power, we give its own role. And you can see we can, how we can do that on a on-the-fly basis. So what about the Actions API? As Chrissy alluded to before, there is an API in Nova that's a little bit, um, it's a little soap-like, including the bad taste that leaves in your mouth. Um, in this case, it is called the Actions API, and this, you can see the URL there is uh, next to the, the post, path, colon, service, server ID, and then whatever the action is. So we're not going to get this in the first go round. Um, in these, the method that you're trying to do is actually in the body of the request. Um, we can't do that yet, but we do have a plan that's going to come as a, a, a phase two. The idea of being able to specify a body key, being able to search through a JSON document and do a match, and that will be in addition to the rest of the role stuff. But getting that right is tricky, and I don't want that holding up the rollout of the rest of the stuff. So we're going to phase two that. Um, there's, there's things hidden in the weeds there. Um, we'll do it once we get verb plus path working alone. OK, so a little bit of Talmud for you. you know, um, this is a, a famous quote, if, I am only for my, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? Which as you know, Rabbi Hillel, and you can see our wise men there discussing it. Well, here's the keystone equivalent of the wise men arguing. This is the keystone middle, uh, mid-cycle from a few years back, and how I apply Hillel to keystone. Um, keystone has to support OpenStack first and foremost, or we have a vacuum. We have stuff that just doesn't work. But if we only su support key, uh, OpenStack in its definition today, um, other services can't inter integrate with OpenStack, and we can't integrate with other services. We, we have a problem there as well. And if we don't fix this now, I've been on this project a lot of damn time, when are we going to fix it? So with all that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, I hope you have some. I hope I haven't borne you all to sleep. Um, and um, what do you got? And yeah, please go to the mics, because the recording, if you're not speaking on the mic, they won't pick you up. So I guess you said it, but just to reiterate, what if there are two routes? And one is more specific, so to say, for a, like if you have two matches, basically. Okay, so you're saying there's two different routes which affect a change, but basically have the same meaning. That's like V1 versus V2, or V2 versus V3 in Keystone. You need explicit routes for those. You would need to make sure that the roles match. You can screw it up by saying you have to be admin. Oh, but I can make a member over here. So that's on you. I don't have a way to fix that right now. That's beyond the scope of Keystone to be able to do. And if you do want to have them have different behavior, but one implies the other, then you would Im use implied roles to do those, those um, matching between that. Uh, Does that answer your question? OK. Uh, where are these policies actually evaluated? And <clears throat> do you have an idea how it affects performance on the API part? So obviously, since we're still writing the code, we haven't done much performance testing yet. Um, it's, you know, there's this kind of a, uh, an inference of an implication <laughs> of ordering there. Um, we did a little bit of you know, back of the envelope calculation, and if you look at how the, role, the routes are matched, it's the same thing that happens in, in Nova when it has to match the route to figure out what code to call. So if that API, if that processing is fast enough now, we figure we're going to be fast enough now, there. It won't be, it's, it's a regex match, so it's not trivial, but it's not horrible. 
Um, and it really depends on how many explicit ro roles you have. So if you only have one catch-all, it's gonna be fast. If you have a lot of little ones, we may start to see something there, but we won't know until we put it in, put it, you know, put it under test. Uh, second small question. Uh, <clears throat> how much do you need for the projects for this to actually get working, implemented in the individual projects? And is, will this be a keystone only thing for a long time, or will it actually be you? Okay, be so used? it's gonna be a keystone middleware implementation, which means that anything that's running keystone middleware will have this by default, which means that all of the other remote services, the Novas and the glances of the world, will get it when it rolls into keystone middleware. That's one of the reasons why we wanna do this. I've tried on other bug fixes to get change into absolutely every other project, and it's one of the reasons why there's so much gray in my beard right now. It's nothing against those things. Everybody does things a little bit differently. It's a whole different process. So the goal is to do this within a single project because it is a single idea. And so it's gonna be in Keystone middleware. It's not going to be a new component that's rolled in. The configuration changes that you saw there, there's already an auth token section in their config files. This will be adding a new set of values into that section. So there's nothing new that's happening there. Uh, do they have to process it somehow in code in the actual component? Do they have to deprecate their own if no. admin or no. whatever? Um, I didn't go too deeply into what's going on right now, but um, very few projects check any role other than admin. And one of the assumptions I have going forward is that we're gonna wanna leave those admin checks in place. Rolling, if you have a, uh, a reference which says, um, admin implies member, then it will pass this check and go all the way on through anyway. So you don't have to do any changes there to keep admins from being able to get on through. But um, if you want to then say, you know, these, these APIs we want to vary independently, we'll be able to do those as well. So um, over time, I foresee stuff being pulled out of the policy files. Uh, I see the policy files getting really small over time. The scope checks are more and more heading into Python code as it is. And we've kind of identified on the Keystone side, we don't want to do those in, in policy.json. Nova's already said that. And in fact, Nova already enforces policy in code. They just don't tell you that they're doing it. Um, so there should be no changes there until we can start removing stuff. Um, it's not a magic bullet, but it should simplify. much for your presentation. I really like your approach and the sentences. It looks like it offers a lot of flexibility. Um, and in our implementation, we've actually uh, gone ahead and implemented a custom read-only role um, yep. in JSON policy files, which sure. has a lot of shortcomings. <laughs> um, and one of the shortcomings is that it's hard to see exactly what it's doing. It's kind of opaque. Um, so I'm just wondering that once this is available, will there be like a test suite that's available to run along with it so that we can see, you know, exactly, like if you feed in, you know, a sentence of a service and a role and... Um, yeah, it, yeah, I didn't... What, I, what are, like, what I would like to see would be, you know, what commands can you run, what's, what's the result, and sure. does it fail for the right reason when it fails? So if you look at what you're just asking for there, that's a lot like what Horizon was asking for. Given this role, what can I do with it? And there actually is a tool right now with policy that might help you out, which is I create a token format, the token response, and it can be a canned one, and run it against the policy file, and the rules will tell me true or false, will this pass or fail. So that might be a tool that today will help you um, in, in existing policy, but being able to build tooling on top of this to do that kind of stuff is very possible. In fact, what we wanna be able to do is build it right into OpenStack client to say, don't actually run this, just tell me which role I need to do it. And we should be able to do those types of queries. Um, Horizon should be able to use this to dynamically generate the UI based on the user that's coming on in. So then you can come up with a bunch of scenarios and say, I want to give a user with this token, let me see what would happen there. So we should be able to build that kind of tooling. And that's one of the major use cases we're trying to support. Thanks. So question about uh, only being able to specify a single role and yeah. in each role and it, and it figures out through. Implied um, role, in principle. Implied roles yeah. and all that stuff. Does that, doesn't that mean that you're gonna need to specify, uh, create roles for literally every endpoint if you wanna say give an application um, access to only one particular endpoint or something like that? Potentially we will have an explosion of roles. If yeah. we get to that point, I will declare victory. 
Um, <laughs> it, it, seriously, I, I, I think that what we can do when we start seeing that we're having too many roles is start saying, on the role API itself, how can we classify these? How can we filter them? We already have a concept called domain-specific roles, which are a class of roles that are never enforced in policy. Those are those organizational roles. I didn't want to talk to, about them too much here. I didn't want to muddy the water. Um, in certain cases, when you list roles, you see them. In certain cases, you don't. And what I think we're going to start seeing is a way of saying, that three-tiered approach I did there, I want to be able to tag things at one of those three tiers. And when I do list roles, I only want to see at one of those. But we're, the, somebody's going to need to be able to see all the way on down. If we really get, do get to the point where we have too many roles, we've seen the success of the system. If it's more like what we have now, which is we have two roles, one of which is treated as a global role and one of which is never checked, I would say we have a broken system. So potentially. I do sure, want I to address right one other thing yeah. on the one role per, um, per API as well, which is this is a requirement for something else, which is the fact that we use Fernet. And we want to keep the Fernet payload from getting randomly sized. And so in order to be able to have a Fernet token with a subset of your roles specified in there, we need to know a fixed size there. Well, the best fixed size we could go with is one. And Got so it. if we say there's one role in a Fernet token specified as a subset of your total roles, we can expand the rest of those out with, with the, uh, the role inference rules. So there is a other work that we're trying to get to tie in with here that it works better if it's only one role. If it really turns out to be a problem, I don't know how having more roles specified explicitly will get there, but we might have, we might have a problem with the in, in, uh, the number of inter interim roles in there, we might need to do some sort of scoping on those as well. But mm. again, big bang up front, trying to get a perfect solution. I think my concern is that yeah. every, uh, speaking from an application perspective, right, yeah. if you want to give, give limited permissions to an application to yep. go, you know, auto scale itself or whatever. Yes. Um, it sounds like we're going to need to then go through every project and say, hey, you need to break down your roles into smaller things so that we can give an application a limited um, thing. So then it becomes a whole of OpenStack scope. Yeah, I think that that's true. But I also think we'll get that information from many different channels. We can't even do it now. We can't even get that information now. We might get it by some people doing tri trial and error and breaking things. Um, we might get it by. Um, Nova engineers who are just smart enough to say, whenever you're doing this, you always need to make this remote call. The Nova one and the Neutron one always need to be in sync. Um, and it might be that we say that this role is not an, you know, linked to a single API. We know that these three APIs are always called together. These three, four APIs are always called together. We'll do it that way. We don't even have the tool in place to be able to do that yet. So yeah. I think if we have some proliferation of roles and then we standardize and we have to help people migrate from one to the other, again, that to me is a success criteria. We can't even do this stuff now. Yeah, yeah this is definitely yeah. going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, this is sort of related to the one role on the Fernet sure. token. Um, can you say a little more about where the implied role expansion happens and how the middleware sees sure. that? And, and sure, so there actually is a couple options here that we could go with. And um, I went with what we have working right now. Implied roles been in Keystone for a while. Um, and I finally got a commitment from, from Dean to look at my OpenStack client to finally get into the CLI. But the other parts of it have been in for like a year. Um, and there's a flag in Keystone that can say expand in the token validation or not. And the assumption is at the start of this is that you're going to have that on so that when you validate the token, if you only have one role assigned, but that implies 15 roles, you're going to see 15 roles in the token. And the, um, assumption, the secondary assumption is that eventually that's going to be a problem, and we're going to want to reverse things. And so when we generate the, um, the, the file that Nova calls to, to fetch its roles, its routes from Keystone, we'll want to expand them there instead. And we can do that as a second rev. But right now, since we don't have those and we're not hitting that barrier, we're going with simple, which is it's going to be when you validate the token, assume you have this flag, the flag set, do it at that time. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a lot of practical considerations going in here to trying to make this something we can actually achieve. So 
maybe this is like too specific implementation wise, but uh, when you do the validation in the middleware, the auth middleware, when will we do the validation? Yeah, the check policy. It's is. going to be the last stage. It's right. going to be after, well, actually, that's a good question. Um, but so the, my real question is, yeah. is, is, is there any caching of th these things live in Keystone, yes. right? Yes, oh, absolutely. So, so well, first of all, um, OK, so a little bit of history on this. One of the things that we toyed with is saying, why don't you just do it when you validate the token, right? So validate the token, do the route check, just pass the route information to Keystone, and you get a, a true or false back. That doesn't work if you cache token validations and they're coming in for different routes. So we know that we need to uh, cache a token validation and be able to reuse that cached validation for a secondary step. Um, doing the check between what you're asking for and the route, that I don't think we will cache because it's, it's going to be just as fast to do a lookup. It's, it's, a, it's a hash table lookup in e either way. And this means there's no persistent storage behind it. So there's no s difference in, in, in storage requirements. So I don't think we would cache that. The routes themselves being fetched from Keystone, absolutely. Those are, those are get stored in memcache as well. Probably use the same memcache instance that we use for the tokens. Um, and if it gets um, you know, expired once a minute and has to do one minute per fetch and that turns to be a problem, we'll tune that too, okay? But that right now is what we're thinking. Get something practical that people can use, see if we start hitting real limits on it. I'm not gonna try to guess what those will be until we have something that we can actually make work. All that stuff's really tunable. Any other questions? Any other answers? How many people out there think I'm stark raving mad? Of those people, how many people didn't think I was stark raving mad before I made this proposal. So I've convinced you now that I am Star Craving Map, but you haven't seen me talk before, so that's not really definitive. Ho yeah, you guys knew me, so you, uh, most of you know that I'm Star Craving Map. Um, thank you for coming for this. Thank you, Christy, for um, helping out with this effort, because I think it really would have stalled, um, and the, uh, the Massachusetts Open Cloud for supporting him, contributing to this as well. Um, and uh, with that, I'm done. Go away. <laughs>